Hi, this is Marcia. And this is Kelly. We are the two U's of Two U's Fiber Adventures. Thanks for stopping by. You'll hear about knitting, spinning, dyeing, crocheting, and just about anything else we can think of as a way to play with string. We blog and post show notes at two U's fiberadventures.com and we invite you to join our two U's fiber adventures group on Ravelry. I'm 100 projects and I am better in motion. We're both on Instagram and Ravelry and we look forward to meeting you there. Enjoy Enjoy the the episode. episode. Good morning, Kelly. Hi, Marsha. People will notice that we are not together. <laughs> We're coming at you from separate microphones in separate states. Yes, I think we have thought it would happen, but well, we should explain why we thought it was going to happen. Maybe people don't know that we were together over the Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. Uh, that you and Robert drove up from California. Mm-hmm. It was a very exciting trip. <laughs> For yes. lots of reasons. <laughs> and, uh, well, so we should say that that uh, you brought the two dogs. Yes. You brought um, Bailey, who travels pretty well. She's gone camping with you, hasn't she? She's gone, uh, well, not too much because of the pandemic. Okay. So she's gone on two camping trips. The first one was right before the pandemic started. And mm. she was she was just learning. Um, you know, we had not had her all that long. And so she got a lot of walks and she was, we were really worried about, you know, leaving her in the crate when we had to leave the trailer and stuff like that. Cause she yeah. went crazy and broke crate doors and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the last time we went camping was in, on, in November of 2020. Mm-hmm. So she's only been twice, but she's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, at least she's, she's more experienced at living with us. Yeah. Right. Then, then, mm-hmm. uh, then Barry. <laughs> and, and then I'm sure this is Barry's first trip. Um, you know, I, I would, would guess. Yeah. Um, and he, he did, they, well, both dogs did great. Well, Barry and- came to us not even really knowing how to get into the car. And not mm-hmm. liking getting into the car. And he has a ramp that we use to get him in. And at the SPCA, they were really, you know, really careful to tell us you, you can't push him up the ramp and you have to lure him with food and toys and, you know, get that cheese in a can and you can spray it on the ramp, get him up there. And anyway, we didn't do that, but we did use a lot of liver and we taught him to get up into the truck which is much mm-hmm. higher than a regular mm-hmm. car with the ramp. So we were practicing we were practicing on the ramp for a couple of weeks before we left. Well, and it's steep. That ramp mm-hmm. is pretty steep. The truck is big. The truck, mm-hmm. the truck is really tall, and the ramp is not that long either. It's uh, yeah. what, six feet maybe, maybe when yeah. it's unfolded. Mm-hmm. So it's, it ends up being kind of a steep ramp, and... Um, I was watching you. He does sort of have to get a running start. Yes. <laughs> and then don't stop. <laughs> yeah. Don't let him stop on that ramp. Because <laughs> yes. he'll just start sliding back down. But uh, And when um, we were first practicing, he would get tired. Like he would go up it a couple times. You know, I could only do it. I could only practice with him a few times because maybe like the by the fourth time, it was too much work. Now he's mm-hmm. he's in much better shape now. Um, well, so yeah. we have to talk a little bit about that. Well, well, there's so many things to talk I know. about. But, but you guys, but you basically arrived on the Friday before a Memorial Day weekend, mm-hmm. which I don't know what the date is. That like the 29th, I think, or something. Something like that. Something like that. I don't remember. Anyway, and um, and you left Tuesday morning. So Memorial Day was Monday, and you left Tuesday morning. And while you were here, we, I think. Saturday, we just sat on the deck the whole day, didn't we? Yeah. And we took the, oh, we took, we took, we the, took dogs the dogs for, a walk for walks. The, a wa- a wa- you know, walks through the neighborhood and then just putting it, sat on the deck and everything. And then both Sunday and Monday, we took them to, uh, the dog park, uh, at Magnuson, mm-hmm. uh, park, which is on people who are not in Seattle. That's on Lake Washington. It's a former, I believe, Navy base that's been converted to a quite a nice park with all sorts of different, um activities there anyway one part of it is a dog park where you can take your dogs off leash 
And you were, I think, a little worried about Bear Barry at first, but you let him off and he did fine. Yeah, I um, I wasn't sure. You know, we'd only had him a month. Mm-hmm. He doesn't really have much in the way of training. Um, yeah. And, you know, he recognizes his name, I think. And, um, but he doesn't have a reliable, you know, come when called. But it was such a long walk from the parking lot to the dog <laughs> park <laughs> that he wasn't, he wasn't fast enough to get away from yeah. me. I, I, if he wasn't coming, if he wasn't coming, I could have run over and gotten him and brought him back to where <laughs> he needed to be. So that was well, good. Yeah. Because I, I, we parked at the southern end, which when you have a long walk to the dog park, there's yeah. a parking lot that you just walk a few feet to the dog park. But of course, I, had, I made I made them go on the long one. But it was better. Um, mm-hmm. It was funny, though, watching him because, and we've talked about this, Kelly, is that um, I, I should also say, too, that the three dogs, um, Bailey and Barry and Enzo, all got along pretty well. They When we first, you guys first arrived, we just took him for a walk and Everybody was really, Enzo was really curious and what, who these dogs were and what was going on, but we didn't have any problems at all with no. him along fine. A yeah. few raised lips. A little lips grumbling and, and yeah, mm-hmm. and hey, this is my space, mm-hmm. but it wasn't, it was, it was relatively easy. But I they were also, will... just so everyone knows, they were also very highly managed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, they were. Well, they were. Uh, it, uh, it felt easy because we were doing a lot of work to make it that way. Yes. Well, they were on leash a mm-hmm, lot. Mm-hmm. All three dogs. My dogs were on were leash. On leash. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think Enzo was on a leash the first the night day. you arrived. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Friday night, and then a good part of Saturday, yeah, I think. Yeah. And then I, I finally let him off leash because he was pretty. I mean, he was pretty good about leading them. Once they all kind of lost interest in each other. Yeah. Yeah, but your your dogs were on a leash a lot, and then, oh, like at at dinner time, you would put them, you know, put them in the truck. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so there, yes, in there was their, a lot of management their going giant, on in their giant four wheel drive silver crate. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Which, just a side note about that truck, I've never seen such a big truck. It's I mean, ridiculous. that truck. It's ridiculous. It's I hope Robert doesn't listen to this. We're going to talk about how ridiculous his truck is. I'm sure it's lovely, but it's it's so big. Uh, and the. Yeah. And I know, Kelly, you're sh- you're shorter than I am, right? But mm-hmm. And I'm not. I'm not a giant, but I'm also not really short either. I'm just average height. But I swear the hood of the truck is over my head. <laughs> yeah. It, <laughs> or level with my head. Mm-hmm. It's so tall. Yeah. It, um, it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and the key fob I, weighs about 17 pounds. Because <laughs> if you drive a big truck, you have to have a key fob with some heft to it. You know? uh-huh. Yeah. It's a, it's a anyway. manly truck. <laughs> <laughs> in the most ridiculous way. <laughs> but well, I have to say it it got us up there, it got us back. It's and it f- filled with furniture too. Filled with furniture, filled with dogs. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, it's going to pull a bigger trailer cuz that's another part of the reason we went up there was to take a look at a trailer that we that we bought that we're having worked on. Um that will replace the little trailer. It'll be a little bit bigger. And so it, this truck will pull that bigger trailer. So, mm. you know, I can't laugh about it too much. But Yeah, stop your complaining. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is because it, it's funny because I did think that your old truck was big. Mm-hmm. It seems small compared to this one. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah. If they were and parked think- next to each other, it would look mm-hmm. puny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, but uh, yeah, and so the so part of the trip was to go look at the trailer, which is in Bend, Oregon, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you looked at that, and then you came up, and then the other part of the trip, um, besides seeing me and Ben and my brother and the dog, and everything, uh, was to pick up furniture. Mm-hmm. So that um, that you and Mark had been very graciously storing for us throughout the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the I think the mirror was actually a year before the I think pandemic. It's more than that, no, I, I mean a, it was a year before the pandemic started. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, I think we've had it two plus years. Yeah, because we were supposed um, to come pick it up. We were planning to come pick it up last year, but the pandemic happened, so it had already been yeah. at your house. 
yeah. a year when we were when when we when the pandemic at least a year when the pandemic started. Yeah. So yeah. Um you posted on Instagram about um getting like your something like getting your crap out of our house <laughs> yeah. or something like that. And I what I I didn't say this but what I wanted to say is it didn't really make a dent. <laughs> Uh, anyway but it's very nice you you had the mirror and then a secretary Mm -hmm. that uh my brother had found and robert's using that and he's very excited about it he's been posting pictures of it on yeah he's very uh, instagram so yeah he he likes it a lot and it's old Mm -hmm. and it's fancy because that's robert is fancy (laughs) so my brother says it's from like 1790 to 1810 something like that kind of cool i wish it could talk yeah i know but you know what i was thinking it's a perfect place for you to write with your fountain pens oh yeah you need to use your antique fountain pens well i don't know that he's gonna let me near it (laughs) (laughs) Uh, well Well, it's very nice anyway but the um and so the dogs were great i was laughing though when we were walking through the dog park uh that um Enzo and Bailey were darting all around, sniffing, and you know how they run ahead, mm-hmm. and then they run behind you, and then they run ahead. And um, Barry reminds me of a container ship, you know, that it takes three miles to stop him. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't, he just walks in a line. He doesn't mm-hmm. veer off to the right or left. Like, he, if he sniffs anything, he sniffs it because he it's, it's crossed his path, <laughs> yes. or his path has crossed it. Not that he's... You were the other dog. Ooh, they smell something and they dart off in another direction. Yeah. He doesn't do that. He conserves uh, very, his energy. He, he conserves his energy, and but we did notice. We think that he, um, we were laughing. We thought he had a little bit of a waste. Yes, we, we yes. think he's getting because um, I can. Yeah, he looks I like can he's almost lost some feel a rib. <laughs> Oh, yeah. he, he is a very sweet dog. He's very good. Yeah, I was I was very dog. pleased with how well he did. And when we um, we camped in a tent, and it turned out to be a six person tent, which was perfect because because there's me and there's Robert and there's Bailey and then there's Barry, who's like three people, so <laughs> fit perfectly. But we we blew up the air mattress inside of the tent and you know made the bed, and he comes in and he immediately lays down on the air mattress like, well, good God, finally you got me the right <laughs> size of dog pillow. <laughs> it was just so funny. He, he cracks me up. He's very mm-hmm. a very goofy dog. Um, mm-hmm. And he just, yeah, he, he's, he's a lot of fun. So he had a great yeah. time. Um, Bailey worries a lot, but I think she had a good time too. And mm-hmm. I had a great time. And we didn't have time to record. We didn't have time to record. We didn't even really knit very much. Not very uh, much. Yeah, you you were able to do some on your on your sweater, but yeah, I knit a couple a little bit, and I but we were mostly just um, managing dogs, getting furniture, you know, walking dogs, um, um, cooking, mm-hmm. talking, whatever. Yeah, and the weather so, was gorgeous. Yeah. I was Beautiful surprised weather. for that time of year. I was kind of surprised and, and I felt really lucky that the weather was so good. So, so we spent pretty much three full days on the deck. Yeah, I think. it was nice. Very nice. Yeah. Well, let's talk about what you were working on on the deck, Marsha. Oh, yes. What was I working on? Oh, my projects. Oh, so my, well, my sweater. Um, and we had uh, some conversations about my sweater too. So um, the walk along tea by Anka Strick. I um, have to tell you where I am now. I think, actually, I can't remember, Kelly. I was working on the sleeves when you were here, wasn't I? Yes, I was, my second sleeve. Anyway, I finished both sleeves. Yeah. And I was listening to our last episode, and I was talking about making them uh, not three-quarter length, but just to hit just above the elbow. And we had that whole conversation about what's the right length. And everything. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, anyway, and I ended up making them so they hit sort of, you know, halfway between the arm pit and the elbow. So they're not, they're not cap, maybe not, maybe even shorter than that. So they're not cap sleeves, but they're not 
they're definitely not three quarter and they're definitely not down to the elbow. Yeah. Um, they're like a regular, and, uh, I think they're like a regular short sleeve. Yeah. That was, yeah, yeah. Like a, a, like a regular, like a women's t-shirt short sleeve. Yeah. 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 And, um, and I'm going to have plenty of yarn. I was worried about yarn and, we, um, we've had a lot of conversations about that, but I'm fine. And <laughs> I did. The yarn um, chicken is not going to yeah, happen. Yes. And I did, um, so in the last episode, I think I was talking about how I had put the body on a waist yarn and was going to do the sleeves and then go back to the body. So now I have gone back to the body. And when you were here, we I tried it on. You said I should make it an inch longer before I start the ribbing, which mm-hmm. I've done. And now I've done, um, uh, I've done two rows of the ribbing, and I have to do a total of five. And then I'll bind off. Now, what I had talked about doing is putting on the sleeves, you do the five rows of ribbing and then you do um, reverse stockinette Mm -hmm. to make sort of this in the contrasting color. And we had a conversation about that and we decided that it's probably best not to do that. So I'm not going to put that contrasting border on. I'm just going to do the the ribbing and and bind off and call it good. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting close to being done. Yay. Finally. Yay. I need to weave in the ends on that tee that I made because I think there is some time I could actually still wear it with Mm -hmm. the weather we've been having. I could actually, I don't have anywhere to wear it to, but, Mm -hmm. but I, I probably could with the weather, I probably could still wear it. And same with you, right? When you finish it, you'll still, you'll still have plenty of days where you could still wear a sweater, you know, a a, a Um, wool tee. Yeah. Uh, On, on Instagram, Kelly, I posted a picture of you sitting on the deck and you have your bare feet, but you have a flannel on. Mm-hmm. And somebody, I remember somebody made a comment about you, know, the, the bare feet and the flannel. And I was like, yes, it's Seattle. You wear flannel in the summer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. Maybe you don't have it on all day, but you'll probably have it on in the morning and in the evening. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I can. Here too. I can definitely wear that. I can wear this uh, um, during part of the summer because it is not exactly hot here all the time. Mm-hmm. So. Anyway, well, but that's um, good. yeah, and then um, I'm still you know endlessly work endlessly working on the pair of socks that I've been working on for months and months. There's really nothing to report. I'm still on the foot. I do you know three or four rows every so often when I pick it up. Um, yeah, and then um, I I continue to work on my spinning project. But I think Kelly, why don't you talk about your projects and then we'll talk about my spinning because we're going to talk a little bit about spinning. Okay. Later yeah. on, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. That does make sense. Okay. So I have some exciting news and then some really boring. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the most exciting thing is that since the last episode, I've actually put together the entire, um, all of the octagons and squares of um, the blanket that I'm making for my grandniece. I'm calling it Phase Flower Blanket. It's a crochet project. I've been talking about it for a while. It's made of Knit Picks Brava Sport. No, Knit Picks Brava is worsted weight, is the yarn. So um, it's the Persian Tile Blanket by Jane Crowfoot. And I really love it. It looks great. It's all put together with, you know, uh, single crochet. I didn't sew it together. I single crocheted it together. And I was able to, with the yarn... Because, you know, I talked about how much yarn I have left over. I was able with the yarn I had left over to always be crocheting it together with a color that was on the edge of either the octagon or the square Mm. um, that I was putting together. So that that was nice. I didn't have to I didn't end up having to mix colors at all with the with the yarn that I was um you know, that I was putting it together with. And I just now have the triangles that go on the sides. It's eight triangles have to go on it and then four corners. Mm-hmm. And then I'll be done. All right. Yeah. But I think she's going to really like it mm-hmm. because it's so colorful and it's turned, it's turned out really nice. And I might, I keep thinking, Oh, maybe I'll make another one of these. I still do once the, once all everything is put together, I still do need to do the edging, as Marcia and I talked yeah. about. Yeah. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not like and it's going to be done tomorrow. And you thought more about that, what you're going to, 
Have you thought more about that? I what you're am do? probably just going to do the edging as the pattern calls for, mm-hmm. just the rows of it, and that's not, nothing, mm-hmm. nothing special. The the real um, action is in all the flowers. Mm-hmm. So I think the border will just do the kind of plain. Yeah, it would distract me. Yeah. I I may, depending on how much yarn I have left, I may have to do like um, not the same color all the way around the whole blanket. You know, for each round, I may not be able to use the same color, but I don't think that will be a problem. I think it will it will go just fine. It won't mm-hmm. even be noticeable with as much riot of color as going on in that so that's really exciting i it went together a lot faster than i expected it to and then um i finished a charity hat just a little beanie with this usually i make um you know enough ribbing that if you wanted to you could fold it up when i make Mm -hmm. a hat but this time i thought no i'm just going to make a one inch or one and a half inch i don't remember something like that uh of ribbing and then the rest of it is just a little beanie, not slouchy or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And it's made of, it's actually not, I don't think it's very pretty. Um, it's, it, I just made it with all the scraps I had left of, of, uh, sock yarn. Mm-hmm. And the colors, mm, only marginally go together. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure it's the it's the best looking thing, but I said that to Robert, and he said, "Oh, I think it looks nice." So I guess you know, to my eye, the colors don't yeah. go together, but but they do kind of. Um, I started with the yellow and purple that I had used in one hat, and then from the pur- from that I went to a just a purple, and then I did purple and blue, and I added in a pink stripe and. Anyways, by the time you get from the bottom to the top, it's changed from this purple and gold, you know, purple and gold, purple and yellow, to uh, um, like a bright blue and a uh, greeny blue color. Hmm. So kind of a gradient, but not really. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a hat. It'll be warm. It's yeah, not. It'll keep someone's head warm. Yeah, it's not ugly. It's just not. Mm-hmm. It's just not the prettiest thing I've ever made. So yeah. And then dishcloths. I've been making mm-hmm. dishcloths. That was my travel project. I did work on the hat while we traveled too, um, but mostly I worked on dishcloths. I worked on dishcloths a little bit on your deck. So I've made mm-hmm. about seven dishcloths out of. I think it's well. It was. It turned out to be four skeins. I still have yarn left, so I guess no three skeins. It's three skeins of yarn that we had dyed some cotton yarn, hundred gram mm-hmm. skeins that we had dyed. Um, I think it was originally on cones, and we skeined oh, it off. Were they cones or ball? I, well, you know the, you know those balls that are wrapped around a cardboard center you know yeah moisturized cotton yeah i don't know it's don't, thicker uh, it's uh, thicker than crochet cotton mm-hmm. um so yeah i don't remember what what it came on but it, it came from the it came from um a weaving stash so or the used. no the stuff isn't it the stuff isn't it the stuff i brought down that i got at the goodwill oh yes Ex- yes it was you mm-hmm. had gotten it that's right yeah i it went those days when the day in those days when i used to go to the goodwill Yes. I don't go there anymore except to drop stuff off. But, <laughs> <You're leaving laughs> but yeah, I yarn. found all of that. She's leaving the yarn for the rest of you who are in the Seattle area to, yeah, really. to go to the Goodwill and find <laughs> treasures. So mm-hmm. yeah, we had and so we we got dyes for cotton yarns and we had dyed all of these. This was maybe four years ago, maybe five years ago. It was very early in the podcast that we dyed mm-hmm. this, and then we just never did anything. We were going to do something with it. And, we were gonna yeah we had we, we had were great gonna ideas, have a show have it as a show topic dyeing cotton and we never did that um, but anyway it's making nice dishcloths I guess I haven't used one yet but um, well and I and I haven't either because I would go out in the kitchen and there would be a a dishcloth sitting by the sink 
And then I go out to the kitchen a couple days later. Well, I was back and forth in between two days, but I go a couple <laughs> days later, I go out there and there was another dishcloth <laughs> that you had made. And I've not used them. I promise I'm going to use yes, them because I, I have must. strict orders to mm-hmm. use them. But uh, um, yeah, I have two. Yeah. And, and well, and, and mine, I just threw one away. Um, the last one that was in my drawer, I just threw away with a hole in it. So actually, I put it in the compost um, with a hole in it. So um, I need to I need to get the ends woven in and get a couple of these in my in my drawer. So yeah, it's my standard dishcloth pattern. It's it, I think it's called the triple L tweed stitch, and it's I just I borrowed it from a pattern that was on Pearl Soho. And I really like it, so I use it to make dishcloths all the time. And that's it. That's the sum total of my my knitting and crocheting. So crocheting okay. the blanket together, knit one hat, knit seven dishcloths. <laughs> mm-hmm. In what three weeks? Because we were late. This episode is late. That's a that's a lot of time for a very little amount of production. Yeah. Yeah. Well. We got the rest of the summer. Yep. Yeah. It's true. So I have not gotten very much done either, but uh, uh, because I've been very busy with projects around here. But anyway, um, so let's just talk a little bit about, um, we had some topics. Well, let's talk about our spinning projects now Mm -hmm. together. And then we can talk because we had some questions from listeners. Mm -hmm. So spinning projects, um, let's uh, talk about that. I... Um, as everyone knows, I've been working on a green and dark brown uh, three ply. And the last time we talked, I think, I don't remember now where I was, but I have finished plying all of the green. And so all I have left is the brown. And this is a merino. And um, what I decided to do is just to spin one bobbin of the this dark brown. And I wanted three ply, so I decided to do a Navajo ply. And the the upside of a Navajo ply is you just need one bobbin. You don't need to spin three bobbins of yarn. Mm-hmm. Um, and which I learned too is that the whatever was on the bobbin that you the the single on the bobbin ends up on all of that yarn ends up on a another bobbin. Do you know what I'm saying? Because if you have three bobbins, mm-hmm. you can't fill a bobbin with three bobbins, oh, right? right? right. It, but if, but a Navajo ply, you just know that it's all going to fit on that bobbin. The downside of a Navajo ply, if if you are spinning like me a bit unevenly, is you don't have two other plies that uh, um that might fill in if it's, if you're in a thin section, it won't be paired with a thick section necessarily. So because you're, you're doing um, a Navajo ply is basically like a crochet chain stitch. Yeah, In fact, it's also called a chain ply. Yeah. Okay. Uh, So, which is great if you're doing um, like, if you want to do a, a, you want to keep the color order in your roving, keep that color order in your final uh, yarn Mm -hmm. is great. But you then have it spinning in order. So if you have a thick section, it's all going to be thick. Yeah. And if you have a thin section, it's going to be thick, thin. Because you don't have your two other bobbins of yarn that are randomly being placed together. And so um, three singles are been, at some point, it's all going to be... Um, the chance of having three thick pieces and three thin pieces plied together are greatly reduced, right? Because right. you've got. So I spun an entire bobbin and plied it, and it's it's nice yarn, but it's not going. It doesn't match what um, the mm-hmm. three ply that I did with the two colors. So that's going to become something else, and I have more roving, which I'm going to just spin three bobbins and ply it the way I did. The other do the traditional so. three ply yeah 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 in yeah. the same way that it keeps in the same way that using that chain ply technique keeps all the colors together mm-hmm. right it mm-hmm. preserves your color order it also preserves your thickness <laughs> so the thin right. parts stay really thin and the thick parts yeah. get really thick and yeah and and what i would say is i don't 
I, I'm not such a I'm not such a perfectionist that I think that that yarn is now bad yarn. Right. The, it's not bad yarn because I think no, actually it looks the good. thick and thin. Yeah, it looks good. It's just that it doesn't match the right. yarn that I have, which is a problem if you're going to use use it together in a project. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not even really that thick and thin. It's just that it's it's different when you put it next to the the other yarn that you've made. It is very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that that is tr- that is true. That it's not you know when you're seeing the yarn thick and thin, it's it's not. Um, like night and day. I mean, right. It's not really right. dramatically no. different, but it's different enough that I w- don't want to use them together with right. the, in, a, in a project. Yeah. And I have a so. feeling that even if your yarn was totally consistent, the just the texture or the feel of the of that chain ply technique is different than mm-hmm. a traditional a traditional three ply. I mean, if you're making socks and you know, you've done a traditional three ply and then you have one bobbin left and you just chain ply it and use that, you know, in case you have yarn chicken issues, you're not going to notice. Okay. Maybe I'm not thinking of this the right way, but if you have three bobbins, Mm -hmm. you're pulling the single off the same direction, right? So the way you Mm -hmm. spun it is all coming off the same direction. But with a chain ply, because you're making a loop, is one half of the loop going back the other direction? It's the opposite direction. So it's like, uh, like I always when I spin a single, the the bobbin is turning. Let me see. It's turning to the right. Yes, it's turning to the right. So is that an S? You know, there's Z, a difference between S and Z ply, yeah, right? Yeah, you you, um, you spin Z and ply S. Okay, so, but with the chain stitch ply or Navajo ply, isn't one of the uh, singles mm. is going to be Z or S or what? I'm, now I'm getting confused. But they're not going to be all, um, you said, what did you say that you spin singles spin in Z, Z and, and ply? ply S. So uh, if you are... Um, with if you had three bobbins, you would be plying all of three Z singles S mm-hmm. ply, right? Mm-hmm. But with the Navajo ply, at least one of them is going to be S in the two Zs. Um, is that? I think if you turn it upside down, it's st- you know if you turn it back the other way, it's still it's still spun the same direction. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay, but. But you're right. There's something about making that loop. There's something about making that loop that makes it a slightly different texture, I think. It mm-hmm. just feels different. Or maybe it's the twist, the amount of twist you put in. That might be part of it, too. Because it's easier yeah. to get too much twist or to get mm-hmm. more twist when you're trying to manipulate that, you know, making the, yeah. the crochet chain loop. And it could be me just being... Um, um, so I was like tense. Well, it, it, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, yeah. I, when I, when was the last time I did this type of mm-hmm, plying? It was mm-hmm. years ago, mm-hmm. and so it, it. I thought, oh, it's going to be exactly the same. Well, it's not going to be. It's never going to be exactly the same because it's a completely different ply. It's a, di- it's a different Just, technique. Yeah, it's a different yeah. technique. So it was, it was a, an idea I had, but it was not. Yeah, it, well, it didn't work. And, this, and yeah, and it's like you said, it's not bad yarn. It's just not the same as it's not the same as the other ones. And, and when you when you do it more, um, when you use the same technique, you'll get something that's closer. Yeah, yeah. So that's where I am. I'm okay. back to that. But anyway. All right. Well, I am. I just finished spinning. I had about I had about 20 grams of. Uh, Santa Cruz Island fleece left. I had 20 grams unspun, and then I had um, tiny little, maybe like one gram amounts on two different bobbins. And so mm-hmm. I thought, oh, I know, I need to get this off my bobbins, and I don't want to throw it away because that was a really nice fleece. Um, so since I had some ready to spin, I just spun all of that up onto those two bobbins plus another bobbin split it up to make it even as I could. Mm -hmm. And then I three plied it. 
So I have a traditional three ply of the Santa Cruz Island, which is the same fleece that I used when I made I made a sock yarn that I put in the fair years ago. And I had mm-hmm. this, I think it was 2018 when I did it. And so I had this um, leftover from then. So it's been sitting on my bobbins since then. And so I wanted to clear them off for the summer spin in. But while I was spinning, I was thinking about how different this spinning that I was doing was from what you were doing. And then also thinking about the questions, some of the questions that we'd gotten in the thread about drafting techniques and fiber preparation. And so let's just talk a little bit about drafting. So how do you draft, Marsha, when you... Um, when you're spinning the, this this yarn that you're spinning right now, how are you drafting? How um, do you hold your well, hands and what do you do? <laughs> uh, well, it sort of depends upon the hour and the day of the mm-hmm. week because I have to admit I'm not consistent. Mm-hmm. I keep changing a little bit. I so, normally do and too. All, yeah, I keep changing a little bit and I don't know. Uh, it's not even about whether that's right or wrong. That's just how I am because we're human and we need to move our bodies. And sometimes my hands get tired. So I have to change a little bit. And, um, and sometimes depending, like when I first start a bobbin, I, I'm a little, it's a little, um, it's different than when I'm just getting into the rhythm of it. Mm -hmm. So I typically, I hold the fiber in my left hand Mm -hmm. and, um, I always think of what you said, you know, you have to, like you're holding a baby bird or a butterfly (laughs) or something in your hand. So not like grasp, but really, really tight. I always sort of pre-draft my, the, let me just say too, what I'm spinning is, most of what I've been spinning recently is just uh, roving that I've purchased, Mm -hmm. um, which is different than something that you've carded yourself. It's a little bit, you know, that... uh, you have but, a lot more choices. I mean, that's what I think about a commercial yes, preparation. Yes, I think you have a lot more you choices. You have a lot more choices yeah. in how you can, how you can draft yeah. and what kind of technique yeah. you can use. Um, also, I would say, too, just about I keep sort of changing throughout the spin, especially when I've done the combo spins, because if you're using different fibers, like sometimes I have, um, you know, uh, Merino in there and mm-hmm. Targi and Corydale and then silks thrown in there. So um, that uh, – and sometimes some mohair, too. So that changes – um, you're going to have to change how you draft depending on what fiber you're actually spinning, right? Right. But typically, like just now, what I'm just doing, you know, 100% merino, I hold the fiber in my left hand. I've sort of pre-drafted it. So it's fluffy and kind of light and open. And then um, I try not to do that, that pin, what do you call it? Pinch and inch or whatever you pinch. <laughs> Inchworm. Inchworm. And that's where you, you know, you hold the, um, where the twist is going in just before that twist, you hold it, it with your thumb and forefinger and, and pull out the yarn. I find that I get more cramps in my hand. That's how I started mm-hmm. spinning. Um, cause I felt like I had more control. Um, but now that I've gotten more comfortable, I find that I get more cramps in my thumb if I hold it that way. So what I do is like, a lot of times I don't even use my right hand. I don't like, I'm just holding my left hand. And then every so often, if it starts getting a little bit, and maybe this is why I have thick and thin bits too. Um, if it starts getting a little thick, then I just take my right hand pinch so it doesn't, it, it stops putting that twist into the thing and maybe unroll it a little bit and pull it out, mm-hmm. you know, but I just sort of, and sometimes I get a long, I get a long piece with a twist in it that's maybe 12 inches long. And then I just sort of pinch both ends and sort of pull it apart a little bit mm-hmm. to get it to the, the thickness I want. Does that make sense yeah, what I'm doing? Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't know what you call that. Well, there's a lot of different names for the different techniques. And it sounds like <laughs> what you're doing is... I mean, I'm doing chaos. <laughs> chaos, the technique. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think you're doing a lot of the things that happen in a long draw, mm-hmm. right? Because you're using only one hand and then your other hand is helping when you need to, to kind of pull it out mm-hmm. a little bit more and make it a little mm-hmm. bit thinner. Are you pulling back with your left hand very much or mostly yes. just holding it straight? I'm pulling back. Mm-hmm. Spinning is such a, I mean, it's such an old form mm-hmm. of creation that I think every person who who's ever spun has spun slightly differently and you know, there's categories of techniques, but within that, there really is a lot of variation. Mm -hmm. So, but like that inchworm technique is called a short forward draw. 
because you're taking mm-hmm. out a little bit and you're pulling it a short ways. You know, you're drafting it a very short ways and then you're letting the twist into a very short little segment. So a short forward draw because mm-hmm. um, you're pulling forward. I typically don't pull forward with my right hand. Most of my spinning is happening with my left hand. That's where I hold mm-hmm. the five or two. And so I usually do a backward draw. Maybe not short backward draw, but you know, maybe a longer backward draw using my right hand. I probably use my right hand more than you do. Um, mm-hmm. If I were spinning like a, a commercial, you know, not trying to spin long draw, I probably use my right hand. It sounds like I use my right hand a little bit more than than you do, but mostly I I you know pull backwards with my left hand, and my right hand mm-hmm. is helping things along as opposed to actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. of the spinning but it's interesting so the commercial preparation that you have um you know the commercial roving or commercial top allows you to do a lot of different things with it right Right. you can do all of those what i was spinning the santa cruz island i was spinning poonies which are like a roll of fiber off the drum carter or the not the drum carter the hand cards Mm. And really, because the fiber is so short, they're really tiny, thin, n- you know, um, not I, the reason I'm calling them poonies and not roll logs is just the size of them. You normally okay. when you roll it off of the hand cards, you have this like sausage shaped mm-hmm. thing of fiber. It's called a roll log. The ones that they make with cotton are much smaller, you know, and, and thinner diameter, and they call them poonies. Okay. And because cotton doesn't um, stick to itself, Mm -hmm. they kind of roll them, kind of, you know, smash them a little bit to make them stick to each other better and not come apart. Mm -hmm. But with wool, you don't need to do that. And especially with this uh, Santa Cruz Island, you don't need to do this because it is so crimpy that it's, it really sticks to itself. Mm -hmm. So with these tight little and the tightness of the, of the roll that comes off of the hand card wasn't because I made it to be super tight. It's because of the crimp of the fiber and what that fiber just wanted to do. It's not going to make a loose kind of loose sausagey shape. It, It just, it had to come off in this little tiny narrow diameter roll. Anyway, it's so clingy to itself that really the only way that I could spin it was with either short forward or short backward draw, mm-hmm. which is not my favorite, but it's a nice fiber. And I, I really enjoyed spinning it because it's an unusual breed. And it's one of the endangered breeds. So I'm happy to spin it the way it wants to be spun. But this is a good example of a fleece is going to tell you how it wants to mm-hmm. be spun because I couldn't do... I could not do a long draw with it. That fiber just clings to itself way too much. Yeah. I couldn't yeah. do a, my normal kind of relaxed backward draw spinning because the fiber just clings to itself so much. Sometimes you can use whatever you want and sometimes you have to do what the what the fiber is telling you to do. <laughs> right, yeah. So, I don't know that you have to start and go, "Oh, this is uh um, think to yourself, oh, this is the technique, this is the typical, or this is the technique that I need to use, or the draw that I need to use, you just organically do it. Because right. you you have no choice but to just to do mm-hmm. it because of the fiber will tell mm-hmm. you. Yeah, That's right. I didn't yeah. sit down and say, this is what I'm going to do to spin mm-hmm. this fiber. It just, that's what yeah. I had to do to make, to make it, you know, to make it work. And because the fiber is so short and so crimpy, in my carding, I've created... I've created neps, you know, little tangled balls of fiber. Mm-hmm. And so I'm also, I, I was also constantly picking off as I was going along, constantly picking off those little neps where I could um, to mm-hmm. make the yarn a little bit smoother. And I was only doing that because that's what I did for the skein that I entered into the fair because I wanted, Mm -hmm. I I was hoping I would get a ribbon for it and I did. Um, So I was being Mm -hmm. really careful when I spun that. So I was Mm -hmm. trying to at least marginally make it match that yarn that I spun because I want to make a pair of socks. And so this will give me a little bit more flexibility, you know, when I'm knitting it 
into mm-hmm. how long to make the top part of the socks because I'll have a little mm-hmm. extra, about 20 more. Right. It turned out to be about 20 more grams. You know, by the time I had a little bit of waste at the end and everything, mm-hmm. I got about 20 more grams of yarn out of it. So that was kind of nice. But I thought it was a good contrast between a carded preparation on my part and a commercially combed or, you know, mill carded preparation mm-hmm. on your end and then the two different techniques that we're that we're using interesting though we both and maybe because you talked to me when you got your spinning wheel but it's interesting that we both hold the fiber in our same hand mm-hmm. hold the fiber with our left because a lot of people who are right-handed do it the other way hmm it's interesting maybe it's because i the first time i spun i spun on your wheel and you showed me how to spin. You probably said put it put it in your left I, I hand, probably, and I follow orders. You know. <laughs> yeah, I probably I probably did. I switch sometimes and spin the other yeah. the other hand again if I'm spinning for a long time, and I think oh my hand's getting a little tired, but that's my typical is to put the fiber in my left hand. I was I did some research and I did find an article and this was on spinningdaily.com. There's an article by Janine. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this. It looks like Backridges. B-A-K-R-I-G-E-S, and it's seven drafting techniques. And she has the names of the seven and descriptions and photographs. So I'll put a link to that article. Oh, yeah, that's good. um, Because that was actually pretty interesting. There's another really good resource for people. Oh, I thought I linked it, and I didn't. I'll have to grab the link for you to put in the show notes. Um, There's a craftsy class that I took from J.C. Boggs Faulkner, called drafting from worsted to woolen and it was really good i i enjoyed that class and she had swatches made out of all the different drafting styles and some Mm -hmm. of them i thought wow you can really tell the difference between those and some of them i thought okay that there's barely a difference and so it's not going to matter in to my for my purposes it wouldn't matter whether I used one drafting, you know, one of the two drafting techniques or the other. And so, you know, it's like, okay, well, I could just choose whichever one I like the better, you know, whichever one I like better, because it looks like you get the same thing when you knit it up. So that mm-hmm. was an interesting course too, that I'll, I'll make sure is linked in the, in the show notes in case someone wants to take that craftsy class. It's still available. I checked it this morning. Any more to add to the, about drafting? I have a a link in the show notes about the different names of the different preparations and, you know, what is top versus what is roving versus what is sliver versus a bat of fiber. And so I have a a link from Abby Frankamont's website that that I thought was a good kind of a primer on, you know, what are the, what do the different terms, what do the different terms mean? We do have a question about how to get started with long draw from how many stitches. Liz, who's in Scotland. Did you want to touch on that? Sure. I just want to thank um, Prairie Poet and Superkip for the other questions about what kind of drafting techniques we use and and what our favorite drafting techniques that we kind of got into earlier. Long draw is, you you kind of just have to have a, well, have a carded preparation, first of all, would be my suggestion. Mm -hmm. Have a carded preparation of fiber and then just be willing to make a lot of mistakes and have the yarn break and then you just start again um, mm-hmm. because you you have to try not to touch it with your right hand and let the fiber come out of your left hand. I think what we said is, you, you, you know, not only do you pretend that you have a baby bird in your left hand, but you have a glass of wine in your right hand. <laughs> so you can't touch your left hand. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. And, and it works. I mean, and, and it's going to be lumpy when you first start and you have to be, you have to be prepared to have lumpy yarn when you first start because you're, you have to just get the feel of it. And you have to be prepared to have it sometimes stretch out too fine and break. You know, slip mm-hmm. apart, drift apart. It doesn't really break, but like, you know, drift apart. And then you have to start again, you know, pull out your end and start again. Um, but you eventually do get the feel of it. And, and it is pretty amazing, um, that it works. And you can also, mm-hmm. there's like a something called a double draw where you, where you draw it back and you let some twist get into it. And then once the twist is in it, you can, you can pull it even, 
pinch it off, you know, don't let any more mm-hmm. fiber come out of your hand and pull it back even more and get it to be finer and like the lumps come out. Any lumps, mm-hmm. you can get those lumps to come out by pulling it a little bit more. Um, it takes, it just takes experience and willingness to be wrong. Yeah. Uh, my, that's again, that's my opinion and my experience. If you get frustrated by having it drift apart or frustrated that you can't make consistent yarn, and then it's just going to be an unpleasant learning experience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But if you just know that you're going to make lumpy yarn and get better the more you do it, then it, it will be it will be a great experience. It's a fun way to spin, I think, and it's pretty fast. Yeah. If you've ever used a supported spindle, that's another way that you could kind of get started. Mm-hmm. Not a drop spindle where you're using both your hands, but a, a supported spindle where one of your hands is having to spin the spindle and the other hand is drafting that gives Mm -hmm. you a good i think gives you a good feel of what that of what that is like so yeah let us know if you want more information we can do a little bit more research i have a question Mm -hmm. uh, uh, just as we're talking about this what is the best drafting technique to use when you have those long wools you know like a lincoln typically people say you know with a long wool you can comb it and keep all the fibers in order you know, all parallel and spin worsted. So Mm -hmm. a worsted spinning would be where you don't let the twist get into your fiber hand. You keep all the twists in front of your, well, for Mm -hmm. us, it will be our right hand. Keep all the Mm twists in front of our right hand and then, and then be able to draft the fiber in your left. And then, um, so you could do a, a short forward, or, uh, or short backward or, you know, kind of go back farther because it's a, it's a, it's a long fiber. So you keep your hands further apart. Right. Your, your inchworm would not be an inchworm. It might be like a, I don't know, a five inch worm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because you want to, you know, you need to keep your hands further apart so you're not pulling on the same piece of hair. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, okay. I don't typically do a worsted technique, even with long wool. I'm, I, my tendency when I'm just spinning for like relaxing pleasure, I let the twist back into my, into my left hand. I'm not, I'm not real good about keeping that twist out of my, out of my fiber hand. Um, Mm -hmm. You get a little hairier yarn that way, you know, more halo, less smooth, but that doesn't bother me. But if I wanted a really smooth long wool, I would make sure I didn't let the twist get back into my back into my fiber hand. Mm-hmm. Okay. I wanted to just give a couple of other resources that um, I think are really good for people who are just beginning, or if you have some resources but you haven't really built a, a spinning library or you know done more than just looking up a few things in Ravelry groups. There's one book that I have called "The Intentional Spinner: A Holistic Approach to Making Yarn." And that's Judith Mackenzie McEwen. And it's a 2009 book. I would really highly recommend it. And then the other one I have is the Alden Amos Big Book of Hand Spinning. And I love this title. Being a Compendium of Information, Advice, and Opinions on the Noble Art and Craft. And this is by (laughs) Alden Amos. um, And it was in 2001. And he has since passed away, but a very opinionated guy. Um... Lots of spinning knowledge from, you know, hand spinning to machine spinning. Um, and so there's a lot of historical knowledge in that book and a lot of other things. So those two mm-hmm. books, I think, are really, are really a lot of information in them. And then I also wanted to mention the Spinner Study Ravelry Group. Um, this month, they're spin- they, they pick a couple of different types of fleece each month. And this month, they're spinning Finn and Teeswater. And the spinning challenge for the month is... Um, called spinning and plying the other way. So we were talking about spinning Z and plying S. Mm -hmm. So I think what they're doing is doing the opposite of that and looking at what that, what that does to the yarn. I also wanted to mention that we'd been talking about knitting with your hand spun and Mm -hmm. Sal Pal had mentioned to me, sent me a message to say that the Three Waters Farm Ravelry Group has a bundle and a thread of patterns that are good for hand spun. 
Okay. And so we'll link to that in the show notes. And then Joanne, Mom Diggity, she suggests that any pattern calling for spin cycle yarn would be a good pattern for hand spun. Mm -hmm. That's true. And then the other thing that I found is this month, just by coincidence, the spring summer 2021 um, Knitty Spin column in Knitty Magazine. Mm-hmm. Um, it's written, it's a column by Jillian Moreno is planning for a project, the beginning. So she's talking about how do you, you know, if you're going to knit something and you're going to spin for that particular project, what kind of things do you have to think about? And so all mm-hmm. of those resources will be, uh, will be in the show notes. And then we had Marsha one more question and that was about how to wash a fleece. Mm-hmm. I haven't washed a fleece in a while. I know I haven't either, but super kip. Natalie, she asks, how do you wash a fleece? For the washing, and this is what she says, for the washing bit, I usually do a cold soak or two and then wash my fleece with really hot water. And in the second hot water wash, I add dishwashing soap. It works to get it clean, but I do have a lot of lanolin left in my fleeces. And then she says, I was recently advised to use colder water or wash with soda. However, the soda felted my fleece. I might have used too much soda, and the Mm -hmm. colder water seems counterintuitive, although I have not tried it. This was a couple of weeks ago, um, but I hope that we can give some some advice to Natalie on this. Well, first, I think we have to uh, differentiate what the soda is. Explain. That when it says here soda, but it's not Mm -hmm. baking soda she's talking about. It's soda ash, right? Or Mm -hmm. um, Or washing soda. Washing soda, which is different. And I I had to look this up. So it's baking soda is sodium bicarbonate and soda ash or uh, washing soda is sodium carbonate. And it sounds like from what I'm reading, it's a bit more caustic. Um, I mean, it can be an irritant to your eyes, nose, throat, um, mm-hmm. and I was looking on Wikipedia that it's used, um, as a sweetener in soft drinks. Hmm. Think about that. <laughs> that sounds odd. <laughs> I know. Um, and I, and I also didn't realize I, I reading just about what it is that it is used a lot in, um, it changes the pH. So, um, it's used also for dyeing non-protein fibers you know, mm. like cotton or. S- yeah, we used it when we dyed this yarn and I'm knitting right, knitting right now, the dishcloths. The right. So, so that it, it, it changes the pH, I guess. And so then the, the dye can attach to the fibers is my understanding. Mm-hmm. So I don't, and I was trying to figure out what is, what does it actually do? How does it separate the lanolin from the wool? Yeah, I know it's a washing aid. I mean, just in general, mm-hmm. you can buy washing soda and you put it in, for, especially if you have hard water. Mm-hmm. It um, it makes your, your laundry detergent work better. Mm-hmm. So from that standpoint, I guess, um, I guess that might be why she was advised to use it. I don't ever use that on wool. Yeah, I it it's um, wool likes an acid pH. Mm-hmm. And it's too basic. And so yeah. I, I I know people do use it, but you are limited to how long yeah, you should this, keep the wool in contact with it. Yeah, the article I was reading, it says uh, to uh, don't use more or um, leave it to soak any longer than 20 minutes. And I wonder, she doesn't say how long she let it, but she, she says here she thinks she may have used too much. But yeah. I wonder if maybe it was in there too long. Yeah. Um, Either one of those things could mm-hmm. could damage could damage your wool, mm-hmm. make it really harsh, um, and kind of cr- I want to say crispy or crink- mm-hmm. crinkly. So um, was the the washing soda or soda ash was that something that was probably developed before we had detergents? I would that you, guess that, yeah. Because I well, when I when I see people use different things, like a lot of times they're using that. What's the wool wash that you can get? I never remember the name of it. Uc- oh, Eucalyn. Mm-hmm. Eucalyn or something. There's also I, another one. Um, there's a scour. There's a unicorn scour mm-hmm. that's actually for not washing garments, but for mm-hmm. washing fleeces. Right. Now, I, but I just, it, I use what you taught me to use, which is I use Dawn. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I don't know, um, I know um, Super Kip is in Europe. So I don't know if Dawn is available. I think she's in Holland, I believe. Um, yeah, I don't. But dish detergent. I, I, I think a dish detergent is a, for me, that, that works really well. And if you use that, I would use dishwashing soap in both of those washes. Mm hmm. And, um, and make sure the water is really hot and that it doesn't cool off. Mm hmm. You know, before you drain the water, because the it, lanolin can reattach to the mm -hmm. fleece. Mm -hmm. um, it's basic, you know, it's like, it's like grease. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about your dishes, even if you put detergent in dishwater, if you then go to bed and leave them in the dishwater overnight, right. while it cools that, that, that grease will be redeposited on your dishes. Mm -hmm. I prefer to use dishwashing detergent and really hot water. And we do have an episode where, um, we talk about washing fleece. It's uh, episode 27B, fiber myth-busting bonus episode, where we talk about washing washing fleeces. And, and, um, and there's some links in that show, 27B, in that show's um, show notes. There are also some links to um, some resources about detergents and mm -hmm. how detergents work and... Well, I would say we didn't even talk, we were just talking about washing it with um, detergents and uh, hot water. We didn't even talk about the washing with it, the, the fermentation process. That's another um, whole episode about that. Yeah, that. that but um, that's where you basically, you let it just uh, f um, kind of, for lack of a better word, ferment in its yes. in the swint, which is the sweat from the sheep. Um, right. And um, I've never, I've never tried that. You've tried no, it. I didn't do it the true way. Um, but I did let it sit in water f and get very smelly for about a month before I mm -hmm. washed it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I ended up going ahead and using soap to wash it too. But I did have to use less. Mm -hmm. it, it washed up faster. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. but I don't know that I, I actually got fermentation happening. Mm -hmm. it, it just was very smelly. Yeah. So. But I, I have a question about the – but when after you took the wool out – the fiber out and washed it, it didn't smell, right? No, it's just while right. it's sitting, the, it's the water that it's sitting in that is so it, bad. Right, yes. Okay. One thing that, that, that I think um, sometimes people don't do when they wash wool is, one, use enough water, and the other, use enough soap mm -hmm. or detergent. And it depends on the fleece too, you know. Is it a yeah. super super greasy fleece or is it a not so greasy fleece? Mm -hmm. Different breeds have different amounts of lanolin. But anyway, yeah, good, great question. Mm -hmm. Lots of opinions about mm -hmm. that question. If you go out and look, um, look around for you know advice about how to wash a fleece. Um, the Alden Amos book talks a lot about using soda to wash fleeces and soap mm -hmm. instead of detergent, which I think, I think if you're using soap, maybe the, the washing soda helps not create the scum that soap and hard water mm -hmm. would, would create lots of methods mm -hmm. been used over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the washing soda is an older method too. Like you said, before detergents were widely available and when people did use soap mm -hmm. more. Yeah. So, um, anything else we need to say about? I don't think so. I think okay. that's it. We'll talk more about spinning over the summer during the summer spin in. Mm -hmm. And, um, and if people have questions they want us to answer or try to answer, um, just put them in the, in the, uh, forum, the discussion thread. Yeah. Or email us, mm -hmm. uh, to use at to use fiber com. And since we are talking about the summer spin-in, we should just remind people that it started Memorial Day, which was May 31st, mm -hmm. and it ends September 6th. We will talk more about washing because I I have, someone gave me a um, alpaca fleece. Mm, and uh, cool. we've been talking uh, you know, about sheep's wool, but now it'd be interesting to talk about how you, but that'll be at another time. I have questions mm -hmm. about that. I have questions for you about that, so... <laughs> I don't think I've ever washed an alpaca fleece. Oh, well, so then. maybe you'll have to have questions for someone else. <laughs> yeah, or, or maybe I'll just have to answer the questions that I have. Answer my own questions. <laughs> right. 
Well, the last thing I was going to just say is that I was, we, we had such a great time on our visit and I, it didn't really hit me until after, well, when you walked up on the front porch, it kind of hit me. It's like, this is the first time we've seen each other since February 2020 it was we yeah. saw it, last time we saw each was when we went to stitches mm-hmm. and it was kind of like and then when you left i like wow we just saw each other it's been <laughs> like it's been so long since yeah. we've been face to face um and it was really kind of remarkable and i we have to thank science right oh yeah yeah that we were able to that you were able to drive up here and, and mm-hmm. come and visit so um thank you to yeah. all the scientists Yes, thank you for that vaccine. All right. With that, I guess we should say goodbye. All right. We'll talk in two weeks. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. To subscribe to the podcast, visit 2usefiberadventures.com. Join us on our adventures on Ravelry and Instagram. I am Better in Motion, and Kelly is 100 Projects. Until next time, we're the 2us. Doing doing our our part part for World Fleece. Fleece.